somehow I found my way into that store and something brought me to that computer. And something else happened, which was something inside me said, you can figure this out. You, you can figure out what this box and this keyboard is and why it's important to you. But I knew it was important. I knew it was exciting. But uh, something told me I needed to pursue that. One of the lessons I've learned in martial arts is that standing still is asking to be hit. If you stand still in business, your competition is going to catch up. I start each morning practicing martial arts because it brings me balance and focus. And I want to know how others stay motivated as well. So join me for conversations on business, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I'm Dan Schulman. Welcome to Never Stand Still. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Schulman, president and CEO of PayPal. And welcome to another episode of Never Stand Still. Today, I'm delighted to have Mark Benioff uh, on our program. All of you probably already know that Mark is the chair and the CEO of Salesforce. It is the leading provider throughout the globe of customer relationship management tools and products and services. PayPal is a huge user of Salesforce, and I might add a growing user uh, as we standardize uh, on their whole platform. But Mark was actually the founder of Salesforce uh, back in 1999, I think it was, Mark. And you know, it's probably hard for you to imagine what it is today. You know, a Fortune 500 company. I think you have something like 50,000 employees, um, and one of, if not close to, one of the top 25 most valuable uh, companies in the uh, country in terms of market cap. Um, Mark has been named one of the top 20 CEOs uh, in the world by Fortune magazine. He's been named by Harvard Business Review as one of the top 10 best performing CEOs in the world. He also recently just bought Time magazine. So he's officially now a media mogul. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about that, Mark. And what's really great about Mark is Mark and his wife, Lynn, are some of the largest philanthropists uh, in the country. Um, they are very focused on children's health. They're very focused on public education, uh, on the environment, on homelessness. Uh, and uh, what they have done has been simply uh, inspiring uh, for so many of us. I'll say this about Mark as well. Mark was practicing this multi-stakeholder capitalism way before it became a buzzword. Uh, everyone is talking about that now in the last year's business roundtable, uh, you know, signed that uh, note talking about the responsibility of companies to be more than just maximizing shareholder profitability. But Mark has been a leader in that. And Mark, one thing you may not realize is when PayPal pulled out of North Carolina because of the bathroom bill, um, that was actually a lonely time. You know, it was sort of like nobody was saying anything and you were the first CEO to publicly come out and support us uh, on that. And uh, I actually won't ever forget that. Um, you were way ahead of anybody else in advocating for LGBTQ rights and, uh, and all sorts of rights against any uh, uh, people that are being discriminated against. Last thing that I'm going to say in my introduction of Mark. Mark is also, and this is something nobody knows, Mark is also the chief quality officer at PayPal. So he is perhaps one of the largest users of PayPal. And every time Mark and I get together, he gives me feedback. He's like worse than my mom. He gives me feedback on every piece of it. But Kind of like my mom, after I absorb all that feedback, I always get better uh, as a result of it. So, uh, Mark, welcome to the program. It's so great to see you. It's great for you to be here. Well, thanks so much, Dan. I think that just sums up the interview. I think it's uh, we should just call it a day. That is perfect. <laughs> yeah, I really, I worked on that for all of five minutes beforehand. <laughs> so, uh, um, 
it's a real pleasure to have you on. Hey, Mark, you know, maybe we can start off um, with a little bit about, you know, your experiences that led you to here. Because, you know, I think you did your first software program or sold your first software program when you were 14 years old. I think it was called How to Juggle for $75 or something. I could use that because my juggling is horrible. Um, and then you had your first business where you're doing video games at age 15. I think you were getting royalties from that that sent you through uh, college. I think your parents actually were entrepreneurs themselves. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and how that has maybe formed some of your thoughts today and where you are? I absolutely will. You want me to lie down on the couch here, Dan? Would that help? Uh, <laughs> back to my childhood. You know, Dan, I, I grew up very close to where you are right now in your home. And, uh, you know, I was born in San Francisco. I grew up in Hillsboro. I went to Burlingame High School. And you're right. I all of a sudden had this amazing experience. And the amazing experience I had, Dan, was that my first job in high school was cleaning the jewelry cases at Kearns Jewelry on Burlingame Avenue in Burlingame, California. And I would clean those cases, and I'll just tell you right now, I was not very good at it. They were getting very frustrated with me. My uh, time there was uh, about to end. But across the street was a Radio Shack store. Do you remember Radio Shack? Of course. For that. Yeah. And I went in there, and they just got this great new computer called the TRS-80 uh, Model 1. And I sat there every day, and no one really understood how it worked. And I kind of started to teach myself how to use this computer. And it was quite amazing, and I had never seen anything like it. And uh, um, I went to my grandparents' house every day after working at Kearns Jewelry, and I said to my grandmother, you know, I'd really like to buy this computer. And she said, well, that's wonderful, Mark, and uh, tell me about it, and I explained it to her. And she had the vision and the insight, and she said, now listen, if you save enough money to buy half of it, I'll give you the other half. I think it was like 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, through my job at Kearns Jewelry, make $250. And uh, she gave me $250. And I bought that computer. And then I took it home. And you're right. I wrote my first piece of software, which was how to juggle, you know, how to juggle. And to teach uh, other kids how to juggle. And uh, it was purchased. And this is what really opened my eyes. The software I wrote was purchased by a company in Goleta, California called C-Load, C-L-O-A-D. And the why it's called C-Load is we used to basically load software off of cassettes. Mm -hmm. um, you remember like little cassettes that you'd play music off of? Well, we used to have those hooked up to our computers, and that's how we would store and retrieve our software. And... Um, they published a magazine every single month with all the software that they'd kind of accumulated. And uh, I sold it to them for $75. I got the check and I said, wow, this is eye-opening that I can actually do something. I can create value and I'm enjoying it too. And I'm getting paid for it. So this was an incredible experience. And I don't think anyone, of course, at that time understood what I was doing my parents didn't really understand. My grandmother didn't completely understand. She was happy I was out of the jewelry cleaning business. She was also, I had a little CB radio maintenance business on the side. She used to drive me to people's houses to fix their CB radios. But wow, I was in software development and uh, that was the beginning. It was crazy. What year was that, Mark? That was 1979. Wow. So I was uh, 15. Yeah. And uh, it was, it was, it was, look, that was a moment in time where somehow I found my way into that store and something brought me to that computer and something else happened, which was something inside me said, you can figure this out. You, you can yeah. figure out what this box and this keyboard is and why it's important to you. But I knew it was important. I knew it was exciting, but uh, something told me I needed to pursue that. What an incredible journey from there to Salesforce. I remember I was running uh, AT&T's first ISP called WorldNet. And I remember first, trying, first. remember sure. WorldNet? Yeah. Of course. And I remember trying to explain 
to the AT&T board what a portal was because Yahoo and Excite had just come out. And to, to your point about new technologies and people not quite getting them, they had no idea what I was talking about. And um, I remember thinking, wow, here's this internet. It's going to be the most amazing thing. And the board of AT&T can't like grasp that concept. It was really, uh, but I knew just like you did then that I, that was what I really wanted to be a part of was that whole internet uh, coming of age. Well, I think that in a lot of these cases, you have to kind of learn by doing. And I think in the case of the internet, I remember very well, you know, fast forward from 1979 through my own software company through high school and college and being an intern in Apple in 84 and finding my way into Oracle in 1986. In 1995, you know, I was sitting there with that one of the first browsers and using the internet. Oh, I was like, wow, you know, something is going to happen. And you could just see, especially when you saw what Jeff Bezos had built with Amazon, that's when I really said, you know what? That's it. All software is going to be exactly like this. Now, it was very hard to imagine that because the browser was quite flaky. There was no security. It was very complicated. But you could see, oh, the potential for this is there. And if he could build this service, if you will, that lets me buy a book, then you can build anything. And that was really the same experience for me where I was like, well, this is going to be important. Pay attention to this. Yeah. So, Mark, so from all that kind of you came into Salesforce, I mean, the stories around the growth there and sort of your battles. I mean, you have taken on pretty much everybody, um, you know, the very, very largest. Um, only with love, only with love. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember some of our conversations around it. It was with a lot of love and competitiveness as well. Um, so let, let me ask you this, though, going into something else like, like your philosophy around this idea of, um, I don't know if I would call it compassionate capitalism or if I would call it sort of multi-stakeholder capitalism, but that came from somewhere. You know, there wasn't, people weren't teaching it uh, in school. Like, what was the genesis of that? Like, you know, you became the leader in that, but how did that, how did that start? Well, when I left college, which was I went to USC and then I was looking around for a you know, place to go. I had worked at Apple for a couple of years in different types of capacities. And then I was like, where am I going to go? And a friend of mine really was encouraging me to go to Oracle. And I'm like, I had never heard of Oracle. I didn't understand mini computers or mainframes or anything that they were about. And they had just gone public. It was a small company, 50 million in revenue, 500 employees, Amazing. You know, they were at 20 Davis Drive in Belmont. I actually really liked that because it was a five minute drive from my house where I grew up. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go to work there. And I did go to work there. And after being there, you know, for quite a long time, you know, I realized, OK, look, hey, we're good at building products and we're good at selling products. And one more question. Is this all there is? Mm-hmm. Is this all there is? Is this all businesses are for? Uh, shareholder return, if you will, or just selling products. So I found myself all of a sudden through a a number of situations uh, in a program which was Net Day, which was kind of being run by these kind of icons of Silicon Valley. And we were in schools in the afternoon and we were kind of putting networks in at the very beginning of the internet. And I, I realized, wow, you know what? A company's purpose can be more than just building products and selling them in a shareholder return. Here are all of these employees. We're able to leverage our relationships. We're bringing this incredible expertise and we're able to impact these public schools, hundreds of them. And I said to myself, kind of in the back of my mind, when I start a company, I'm gonna actually build this in. So not only are we gonna build products and sell products, and make that great, you know, but we're also gonna kind of make this kind of who we are. We're gonna make sure that our company from day one is organized to do more than that. And so we did three things on day one. We said, okay, we're gonna create a new technology model. We call that the cloud now for enterprise software. A new business model, we call that subscription. And three is 
a new philanthropic or compassionate capitalism or stakeholder model. We didn't have those words then, Dan. It was 1% of our equity, 1% of our profit, and 1% of all of our employees' time would be dedicated to doing something for others. And that was day one. That was a very key and seminal decision because it really created the culture of Salesforce. And look, Peter Drucker probably said it best, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So your culture, you and I know, are very, very, very important. And that's why, you know, our values, who we are as a company, the things that are important to us, these define our culture. So here we are at the beginning of Salesforce. I had had that incredible experience at Oracle. I was leveraging that. Oracle is a great company, great CEO, incredible experience in my life. Now I want to leverage that into a company that I am starting. And I want to try to create culture from day one. And wow, it's turned out better than I could have imagined. And I think that maybe we've even influenced a few other uh, companies along the way. Well, you definitely influenced us. I remember actually uh, talking exactly the same thing with um, Franz Pasha, who I was bringing on to run all of our corporate affairs. And we were talking about, do we set up a separate foundation for all of our ESG work? And I said, no, I don't want something separate and over to the side. I actually want us in our products to reflect who we are as a company. And to your point, I mean, I don't think it could be any more powerful in attracting great talent and just, you know, and in inspiring uh, the company. Well, I think that why this is important is I think that for a lot of leaders, I actually think for most leaders, it's in us already. It's in us, it's deeply in us, and it just needs to get awakened or really kind of given permission. You know, I love that book, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, because it kind of says, hey, sometimes you just need permission to do the right thing. And I think this idea, what you did, for example, in North Carolina, that gives permission to other CEOs to also do the right thing. And that means use your business as the greatest platform for change. Look, yes, PayPal's a great product. Yes, PayPal's a great business model. Yes, you have great customers. But I also notice that every time I make a PayPal purchase, I'm always asked, would you like to give some money to another organization, someone who needs money right now, a food organization to help more create more food security, a children's health organization to create more children's health? Something always gives me the opportunity. And by the way, even if I don't remember, it reminds me, hey, last time you were here, you gave some money for this. Do you want to do it again? That is just giving me permission to do the right thing. And I just love that about PayPal, that it's part of your product. It's part of your culture. It's part of who you are. It's why I agreed so quickly to do this interview, because I absolutely believe that your company has done amazing things, that you are an example that you show that business can be a platform for change. And look, many CEOs don't agree with us. You know that. We will go to these CEO meetings. We'll go to these events. We're part of these councils. We're about a part of these clubs. And they'll kind of look at us and they'll snicker and they'll kind of get together in the side, point at us, whisper quietly, those fools. Because (laughs) they just don't believe that this is important. Just focus on your share price. But they don't know a secret that you and I know which is one of the reasons that Salesforce has done so well. And one of the reasons that PayPal has done so well is because of this culture. And one of the reasons that the performance of the company is there is because of what it does beyond build and sell products. And while other companies maybe have run out of gas, in the very markets that we're in, we continue to go fueled by the good karma that has been created by these actions. So I, I'm thrilled you know, to see what you've done, Dan, and I'm thrilled to see what so many other companies, thousands of companies have done. Because I'll tell you, when I started Salesforce in 99, and I think you remember this, there weren't a lot of examples. No. There were not a lot of examples, especially in our industry and technology. But today, I have a lot of examples of companies who have created foundations and done great work you know, with integrated philanthropy and uh, into their products and great leaders who have transformed. This is very, very important. And this is an important moment to really inspire, to educate, to motivate, you know, other leaders to say, you can do this too. There's a lot of models. You don't have to take take my model. You don't have to take Dan's model, but you can choose your own model, but you just have to let it awaken you uh, inside you, but you need to do something. Yeah. I mean, I think 
when I talk to different CEOs, I mean, there's this idea of creating an amazing culture inside the company and what that can unleash. But if you don't do it, I think you're at a competitive disadvantage. You know, the best people want to come to companies that are making a difference, that have a set of values that act on those values. And so I feel like it's not only our obligation to go and do that, but honestly, it's our competitive advantage by doing it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, every company has to ask themselves, what are your values? What is truly important to you? Every company has values. It's just, what are they? And when you actually can figure out or elicit or actually understand or have awareness and ask yourself, what is really important to me? And let me look at it in priority. This is number one. This is number two. This is number three. This is number four. At Salesforce, it's trust, customer success, innovation, equality. Those are our four core values. And then we operationalize those values by saying, how do I create more trust? How do I create more customer success? How do I create more innovation? How do I create more equality for every human being. And we are asking those questions every day. And by asking the questions, you're going to get the answer. But if you don't ask, you shall not receive. So this is very, very important. And I think that what we have to do is say, what are our values? And let's operationalize them. And let's really be aware of what values that we're choosing for our organizations. And look, even for ourselves as as leaders or as CEOs. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me go to uh, last question that I always ask uh, in these um, uh, in these interviews, Mark. Um, what people see is the Mark Benioff of uh, right now, very successful, you know, um, a leader. Um, but along the way, we all get knocked down all the time. And the real question is like, not what what was an example of you getting knocked down, Mark, because I'm sure there are hundreds you can refer to, but what lessons you take from like, how can you tell people like how to get back up and move forward? Well, I'll tell you, I guess one of my biggest lessons for myself is I'm a very trusting person. I mean, Salesforce, our highest value is trust. And one of my highest values is trust as well. And I really put out there a lot of trust. And you know, I think that where I've kind of been disappointed or where I get knocked down or emotionally I get, you know, even I would say a little depressed is because I kind of put it out there that I have a relationship with someone or I build trust with someone or I'm kind of putting my best intention forward and I'm not getting that back. And I'm getting maybe mistrust back. And when I get countered my highest value with a negative to that, wow, it really hits me hard. It really creates almost a sense of loss for me. I I don't fully understand why that is. So what I've learned is that I just need to be, you know, absolutely committed and go as deep as I can into trust. I need to like double down and go even more deeply into that. And as I've done that, what I've gotten is just a much more pure, more straightforward, more focused, more motivated attention in that area. Because look, I realize I'm looking at business in a way that a lot of people are not looking at it. They're not looking at it as almost like a spiritual pursuit, that business is the platform for change, that I can make the world better, that I can help improve people's lives, that in our headquarters in San Francisco, I hope that Salesforce has made an impact. You know, we've got given $130 million to our local public schools. That's part of almost a half a billion dollars that we've given away. We've done 5 million hours of volunteerism. We've done you know, 40, 50,000 organizations run on Salesforce for free. Not PayPal, but nonprofit NGOs use our product for free. And I hope that Salesforce is improving the state of the world. I, I feel that I need to be committed to improve the state of the world and that I need to trust my belief. And look, not everyone is going to see the world like you and I do, Dan, but more people are. And they realize you can use yourself, your life, your company your pursuit, your relationships, your technology to make the world better. And yes, it's 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 not going to be easy that you you can trust and you may not find that everyone is as trusting as you are or that you're doing the right thing or your intention is straightforward. They may have other intentions or they may have other ideas what they're trying to get done. You have to persevere. You have to be committed to go forward. You have to go faster, stronger, higher, and that will bring you to your North Carolina or you know, the many things that we've done at Salesforce, and then you will go right through them and you'll be stronger 
for it. So anyway, Dan, I want to thank you for everything that you've done and for everything that PayPal has done, because it's so impressive to see it. Not only a great leader, but also a great company with great values. And it just inspires me every day. And I, I do. I love your product. And when I use it, I know I'm using a company's product that has great, great values and a great heart. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mark. Mark, thanks for uh, taking the time with us. Really appreciate it. I'm sure everybody can see why Mark is the person he is. So thanks again, Mark. Thank you, Dan. Bye.